All right, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining today's startup pitch. Again, today we will meet promising early stage blockchain startups. We have three teams with us today. We have Prime, we have also Fight, and we have Bit Power today joining us for the startup pitch event. Um, we'll introduce the teams in details uh, later in the event, but moving on with agenda for today, um, I'll do a short introduction about what is Blockchain Founders Group and what we do. And then we will also introduce our startup pitching teams and also the judges. Um, we'll also have the startup pitching and then the judge will do a short Q&A afterwards. And then after that, we will proceed with announcing the top two teams and then we proceed with the closing. And that's it for today's event. Moving forward, uh, my name is Albert. I'm the host for today. I also joined with my colleague, Melissa. Uh, I'm the program manager at BFG Superstars. It's our in-house blockchain incubator program. We have started since 2019, and now we have incubated more than 15, more than 30 teams actually, and invested in 15 teams. And Melissa, would you like to say a short bit about yourself? Sure, Albert. So hi everyone, I'm Melissa, the Marketing and Operations Manager at Blockchain Founders Group. I'm passionate about hearing new ideas from startups. I love building partnerships and connecting people. And I run these monthly pitch events with my colleague Albert here. And so we're both really looking forward to hearing from all the startups today. Awesome, Thanks, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, yeah, again, if you're interested in connecting with any of the pitching startups or if you have all your own startups, feel free to reach out and connect with us and we'll inform you with the upcoming pitch events as well. Okay, so moving forward briefly about us, uh, Blockchain Founders Group, we are a venture capital and we are also a company builder. As a venture capital, we invest in like uh, crypto companies. We are Web3 agnostic, so we're interested in any Web3-based businesses. And as a company builder, we have our own incubator program. It's called BFG Superstars. We are on the program twice a year. So right now we are running the first cohort in this year. And again, we are interested in any kind of blockchain-based businesses. As you see here, this is part of our bigger portfolio. We have invested in over 45 startups since our initiation in 2016. Moving on, this is our executive teams. We have our executive directors that's capable and experienced in the field of legal, business, and the partnership, as well as um, the blockchain itself. And our company is run by our executive partners, which is Sarah Cotwald and Martina Joseph Davis, both are very experienced in entrepreneurship and also Web3 businesses. Moving on, um, this is the BFG core team. Uh, me, Melissa, and also our colleagues, Max, Jongchan, Elias, and Yona. We are the core team of the program. We are running the incubator program as well as helping startups to reach their maximum potential. Um, on the right side, you can see these are the teams that are already successfully uh, graduated from our incubated program and got invested by us in the past years. And we are looking forward for new startup ideas and teams to join this list. Um, I'm very excited today because we will be joined by our uh, judges. First, we have Jaroslav and we also have Ludovic. Hopefully, he's joining us by now. But first, I would like to give the stage to Jaroslav to introduce quickly about himself. Jaroslav, please. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jaroslav. I'm a serial entrepreneur and founder of uh, Web3 Focused Venture Studio named Yard Hub. Um, we are located in Dubai and Barcelona, Spain. Uh, we are developing projects from from idea to um, to working ventures. Um, in our portfolio, there are different projects from uh, gamify DeFi sector. Uh, we are also now uh, investing into uh, a few projects which are connected with uh, customer data and storage on blockchain. Um, yeah, so I've been working with startups as as an entrepreneur, as a mentor and advisor for. Uh, I think I know the 20 years by now already. So I'm um, we'll be really glad to to watch what great ideas you've got today here and uh, maybe um, yeah help with some advice ideas. Um, yeah, hope today will be very interesting. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yaroslav, for joining us today. Um, I suppose Ludovic is not yet here. 
So we could move forward with introduction of each teams. Uh, Melissa, please take over. No problem. Thanks, Albert, for that introduction. So now I'll move on to introduce each of the startups that we have today. So in this pitching order, we will first have Team Pime, a Web3 discovery platform that enables users to learn about new Web3 projects, unlock rewards, earn offers and collectibles, and they aim to ultimately empower users to control their data. Next, we will have Team Fight Treasury Protocol, a trustless and autonomous on-chain treasury management solution. So they allow users to diversify their assets, unlock liquidity, receive yield, and retain governance. And third, our third startup pitching today will be BitPower. The team is building blockchain infrastructure for businesses, allowing them to access multiple protocols and technologies to scale, build, and even run yeah, digital assets operations. So each of these teams will be given six minutes to pitch, and they will immediately face five minutes of question and answer time with our judges today. And at the end of the pitch event, we will announce the top two startups based on the rubric scoring. So as for the rubric, um, each startup will be evaluated on each of these criteria. So first, it will be the market potential. The startup will be judged on whether they have identified a genuine area of interest in the Web3 space and whether their project has been effective in addressing it. Next, the technical feasibility. The startup will be judged on how well it integrates blockchain technology into its project and whether the technology used is a relatively novel application. Third, we'll be talking about the scalability of their business models. So the startup will be judged on how scalable their business model and growth plans are from a regional to a global level. And lastly, the strength of the founding team. The judges will be evaluating the team with their educational background and past experiences. So they'll be looking at how well this team is equipped and confident to develop to deliver the project. And so without further ado, let's welcome Team Pime and Simon to share more. Great, thank you. Let me just get set up. <laughs> Can you all see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. Great, let me just start recording my side. Great, let's do this, shall we? Hey everyone, I am Simon Pime, CEO, and I'm a community marketing expert. In my previous companies, I've raised over, sorry, I've generated over $10 million in community-led sales. I know how to acquire and retain users. Since launching Pime just under a year ago, we have grown our community to over 170,000 verified users while being cash flow positive. We did this organically. No KOLs, no paid ads, no influencer shills. Let me tell you how. Web3 has a cold start problem. Many companies build great product and then desperately hope to find users. It's a strategy almost guaranteed to fail. Over the past few years, companies raised a lot of money that then went on conferences, on parties, on vibes, and at best, airdrops that delivered no long-term value or retention. Companies created noise and hype, yet no future. And for users, there's rug pulls, the scams, the here today, gone tomorrow projects, and then the whole industry loses. Yet for Web3 to achieve mass adoption, it needs to build real products, products real people want and need. It's a problem and a market we know incredibly well. I will never forget the first day I heard about NFTs. I thought I was going to be a billionaire overnight. I thought I was so early. I called Bilal, my co-founder, and we immediately got to work building what we were certain was going to be the next CryptoPunks. We launched the project, and what a surprise, it failed. We made one sale. And that was us just checking that the contract worked. We learned painfully the importance of distribution. Yet we put our heads down. We got to work. We built, launched, tested, broke many things, got a lot of feedback. And a few pivots later, we had a fast-growing community, excited users, and excited companies. A year later, hundreds of companies have used Pime to incentivize users to take specific on-chain actions with quests, such as engage on social media, hold a token, or buy an NFT, 
We use blockchain technology to automatically verify each action taken. To date, we have generated over 4.7 million actions through Pime. We have run quests for incredible companies such as Unstoppable Domains, Gods Unchained, and OKX. Yet the opportunity isn't in quests. It's a crowded marketplace and a race to the bottom without a hope or scale or a business model. However, what gives us an advantage is in Web3, community is distribution. And we are the best team to capitalize on that. Bilal and my co-founder scaled our previous startup to $3.4 million in our first year before leaving to start Pine. Diogo joined us recently from blockchain.com. And so far we have received support from angels, governments, leading accelerators, and industry partners. We have generated over $400,000 in revenue in the past 12 months, with 95% of revenue having come from our community. We have done this by placing the community at the heart of everything we do. People want to be the core of projects. They want to be there at the beginning. They want to have a say and they want to play a role. Yes, it can be crazy at times, yet people don't just want to be a buzzword. They don't just want to be part of a throwaway effort because somebody told a founder that it was important to build community. We believe that our community deserves an upside in everything we do. Next month, we launch our token and transition to a DAO. As part of that move to a DAO, we will narrow our focus on launching projects built by us or projects we exclusively partner with. Pine DAO becomes a community launchpad, enabling companies to scale from day one. And we make, a, we make money in a couple of ways. Firstly, launch products created by us. We're already on our way with the first product. Secondly, we partner exclusively, exclusively with selected projects that we know our community can help. The founders get to focus on building products while we build distribution and community. In exchange, Pine Dow gets a percentage of the tokens. We are building an ecosystem where everybody wins. Companies get people using their project products from day one, from the day that they launch. And our community is incentivized to help those products grow and shout it from the rooftops. To show the power of our community, we ran a campaign right now, literally five minutes ago. There are hundreds of people joining us right now to celebrate the power of Pine community. Yet this is just the start for us. Over 20,000 members have paid to join our ecosystem. And we expect this to rapidly grow when we launch our token and move towards a DAO. Our foundations are solid. Our team is ready and our community is ready. We are on a mission to launch and accelerate Web3 consumer products that solve real world challenges. And we, we believe Pine is the answer to doing exactly that. Thank you. I'm excited to take your questions. Thanks so much for that, Simon. Uh, so now we'll bring on Yaroslav to ask any questions. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Thanks, Simon. Great, great pitch, great presentation. Um, I wonder, you, you, you mentioned that you've generated uh, 400,000 uh, in revenue is, and generated by the community. Is it kind of a subscription model or what is this a community generation revenue generated means? Yeah, so we, we bootstrapped the community certainly to start with through uh, NF, NFT sales that converted for Pine Points. Pine Points computing, converting for future tokens. Um, certainly as people completed the actions and the quests, they earned pine points for doing those actions. So we, we really developed that circular economy from very early on. Uh, and that's where people have then had the opportunity to take part in our eco ecosystem. The majority of that growth has come from two ways, people buying lifetime gold memberships. So we have a gold membership tier uh, and then pre-sale uh, vouchers for, for future points. Okay, so so that um, I mean the revenue is is coming from users. I mean paying for membership or or vouchers, yep. and uh, I wonder what is the um, business model besides that is. So uh, how do you make money? I mean, like you, you can't make money from your users forever, obviously. So uh, what is the other revenue streams that you are thinking about and planning for? Yeah. We, we tested a lot, you know, so we, we certainly tested going down a monthly subscription model. We, we partnered with a lot of companies to do that. We, we found that it would just turn into a very expensive SaaS platform and actually couldn't scale for us very well. So um, we, we looked at a usage-based model. It didn't work. We, we do believe the, the value capture through the token will create a sustainable ecosystem for Pime. As it launches, 
new products and then launches. So the one side, us launching new products, we have one coming soon. It's already in development. The second, and that is not an allocation goes to the DAO, but that has the right to go and charge its own user base to, to certainly introduce its own token. The second side is us partnering with products that are not developed by us. And that is where we would then take a percentage of their tokens, um, certainly to totally negotiable, which the DAO would have the right to sell, the DAO would have the right to hold, depending on what it sort of fit. Uh, and so the company will be funded by DAO, as far as I understand. Uh, the the Pine DAO will be, yeah, we, we have a holding company, we have a labs company, you know, that will launch other products and the DAO will get an allocation of those tokens um, of every project that we launch. But the the company will not be funded by directly the DAO. The DAO will fund the launch pad. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm a bit confused here. So you said that the projects will give part of their tokens to the DAO and then DAO will decide what to do with that tokens. But how you as a company that has operational expenses uh, are going to, uh, I mean, like to man to be managed as all tokens go to the DAO. Yeah, but by launching other projects, by launching other products, that that's okay, so the, making revenue from from the projects you launched. Yeah, using okay. the using the ecosystem to launch other products. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Uh, yeah, Albert, do you have any questions to add on? Um, yeah, maybe quick question from my side, because I also saw that you have like this gold point. So how, how will this functions once you got transition into the DAO model? Because, you know, if I already burn my gold and there's like this DAO and then they like offer right, whatever this, um, benefits that I have on the gold, for example, what, how it, it will affect your old members, for example. Yeah, we're, we're releasing our DAO constitution in. 15 days uh, and there's certainly a mechanism in that is there a potential for uh, and something we, we spend a lot of time with legal advisors on but also thinking about is how do we really lean into decentralization and, and if the community was to choose to you know fully change that then whilst we think that would be bad th there's certainly an argument to be made for if the community was to decide that that's what it should do then then that's the best thing for the community and the DAO in its own right we're pretty big believers in decentralization and, you know, community empowerment. I, I don't think it would be right for us to long-term say this is fixed and this is what it should be forever. All right. Okay. Because I mean, I'm, I'm following with Yaroslav's question because once you transition with this DAO, then there's going to be a shift, a shift between your, for your business model, right? So how it will be sustained in the long run, because you already have your previously paying customers and then now you have like this new people that will govern the whole ecosystem, how will you like manage them? Yeah, so, so that's one thing. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, it's something we spent a lot of time thinking about the, the new products that we have launching uh, are very much, you know, revenue generating and consistently revenue generating. We, we do believe that we will be able to introduce to the DAO ways for them to allocate tokens to the company. You know, we spent a lot of time with legal advisors to ensure that's the case um, that can run operations for the launch pad that, that we're partnering with the DAO on. We, we very much see the company, the, the holding labs entity, being a partner with the DAO going forward. All right, got it. Thanks. All okay. right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we'll now move on to the next startup that we have. Uh, today, next would be Fight Treasury Protocol presented by Carlos. Yeah, thanks. Here, let me share my screen. Does that look all right to everyone? Yep, looks good. Okay, so thanks everyone for inviting me and Blockchain Founders Group for setting this up. We are Fi Treasury. We are building our startup to really solve the treasury management issue that happens to really all crypto companies when they hold assets on chain. And we're doing this through the creation of on chain indexed liquidity pools. Uh, it's effectively liquidity pools, but introducing dynamic weights so that the assets, uh, can be kind of shifted around as needed to replicate a typical index fund, which we believe is really the best way to diversify risk. Um, so I think why this is kind of the right time to do this is that as we've seen over the last year, crypto is highly volatile, but there's also issues in the traditional finance space with banking failures, right? So there is an increased need and an increased importance to hold assets on chain, but the majority of current uh, protocols, current tokens, they use really unsustainable um, kind of metrics, right? They hyperinflate their token. Oftentimes they actually increase risk when they claim to decrease risk. 
Um, and what we're looking to do is really create a one-stop sustainable system where crypto companies can essentially outsource their portfolio management to us, this autonomous system that we're building in order for them to really gain the upside that crypto has to offer without having to have a whole team on staff 24 seven to look out for things like DPEGs or hacks. Uh, so kind of just the way that this works, we are actually building this from a traditional finance vehicle called an exchange fund. So an exchange fund was traditionally built for startup founders and executives, where the majority of their net worth was in shares of their own company stock. So what they would do in those times is investment bankers would go around to about 30 of these different founders. These could be the founders of Apple, Netflix, executive at Goldman. And as a way for them to hedge their net worth, they would deposit shares of their stocks into the vehicle, and they would get the returns of the overall fund. So we're bringing this on chain. We believe there's actually a really good use case for companies like DAOs, for example, that have the majority of their crypto treasuries in their own native token, but can't really sell them because by having too much of these tokens, they create this imbalance and they end up crashing the price of their own token. Um, so the market for this is huge. Uh, we initially built this for just DAOs because us as founders, we had built a few DAOs. We built the DAO at London Business School and really bullish on that sector and really interested in innovation it brings. But our client base has really expanded to other crypto companies, groups that um, maybe get paid in different tokens from other DAOs, uh, even founders, uh, but also groups like family offices and investors that want to have this index type of exposure on chain. Uh, so we've had a few of those clients as well. Um, so just a little bit more about the issue specifically with DAOs, right? If you look at the top DAOs, a lot of them have billions of assets uh, in their treasury. If you think of like a Uniswap, if you think of like an Aave, huge companies, 99% uh, fully concentrated in their own token. So when I first saw this as a C3 charter holder, I realized this makes no sense. You want to diversify away risk. Uh, but it's really because there's an infrastructure issue. So for example, if Uniswap wanted to sell even 2% of their native tokens to start diversifying into even like things like cash or Ethereum, they would actually crash the price of their own token. Uh, so not only would they actually get back uh, less money because of slippage, like a 10 cents on the dollar type of uh, exchange, but they would also wipe out about a billion from their current holding. So it's really a situation that makes zero sense. Uh, so when we got our heads together and identified the things that need to come together to really make treasury management work, it's really four fields, right? It's diversification, which we're solving through our vehicle where um, people that have the tokens on our whitelist can deposit directly into this vehicle. And in return, they'll get back uh, what we're calling the treasury token which you can think of as like a share of a mutual fund or an ETF. Uh, and since there'll be a lot of other tokens being deposited into this pool, you get instant diversification without having to manually sell into different assets and manage that yourself. Um, now when they have this, uh, and so the, the assets in the pool as well will create yield where we, can, where we can by bringing it, by staking different assets, by bringing on stable coins that, for example, are bringing in treasury bonds on chain which for a lot of these native DAO tokens, it's really hard for them to generate sustainable yield. Um, and we're also allowing proxy governance voting because when a DAO goes to sell their token on the open market, it, they open themselves up to governance attacks. So we are allowing the delegation of their deposited assets so they can still participate in the voting process and still participate in their governance as needed. And the other thing that we're very focused on doing is that when the holder has this treasury token, we want to also introduce more of this visa type of model where people can use the treasury token as a means of payment. Uh, and because we're fully backed by uh, like at least 50 different assets within our pool, we can kind of spread out that sell pressure. And we're also introducing protocol on liquidity, which means you know, we want to incentivize people to open up Uniswap LP pools for us that we will then kind of buy from them um, in exchange for an incentive. So really, this will work as a mechanism to keep create a kind of really balanced and sustainable ecosystem. Uh, on the back end, it's complicated, but on the front end, we want to make it super user-friendly and gamified, where people can simply go on our site, 
They can deposit multiple tokens in that are whitelisted. They can uh, swap tokens in and out in order to help us balance the pool. So having this kind of gamified uh, version of it. And then they'll simply be able to go to our governance section so they can redelegate the voting powers to whomever they want to, and then still go on Snapshot or still go on the MakerDAO forum, for example, and continue to vote as they normally would whenever. Uh, so this is just a little bit about how the exchange pool works, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, where people would deposit this pre-vetted list of assets. Uh, there'll be concentration limits as well within the pool. So as uh, in order to kind of not create a 80% Uniswap pool, we want to really kind of diversify the risk. Um, these are kind of the four different things that we're covering. Just a bit about the team, uh, very experienced team, our CEO, uh, head of investment, was previously JP Morgan's chief investment office group, leading up their blockchain research. Uh, we all built the London Business School DAO together. We have numerous PhDs from synthetics, Wintermutes, uh, Ocean Protocol, groups that have experience uh, building agent-based simulators, for example. Uh, our CFO uh, was on the board of one of the largest private equity firms in Africa, focused on fintech investing, and he helped launch a few um, exchanges. So that's really going to help from the regulation standpoint. And our CTO was previously at NASA, uh, an assistant professor at Stanford as well. Um, so just in like the last minute, I guess we have four revenue streams that we're creating. The largest chunk will come from this protocol owned liquidity, which is really like this market making angle that we're, we're, uh, we're building up towards. All of those revenues will flow to our own governance token that we're calling the FI token. And the FI token is introducing a few different novel bonding curves in order to one, accrue value to the token when the market is moving upward, but they're in certain time periods, call it volatile market environment, they'll have uh, an inverse bonding curve so that we can inject liquidity into our system in order to act like as a backstop to prevent these kind of runs in the bank that occur in crypto and in traditional finance, right? Um, so just a little bit about our investors uh, led by OP Crypto. We have Arrington, a good group of angels as well. Uh, so kind of very strategic guys that have helped us really build our initial client base. We have about 50 different clients on our wait list, uh, 10 different LIs from groups like Arrington and Merit Circle, uh, and then quite a few others. We expect to launch um, at about at least 20 million TVL uh, on day one. Um, so just a little bit extra, but uh, I think I'll kind of skip over this. And just roadmaps, finally, we expect to launch on mainnet towards the end of summer, uh, and our own governance token will launch at the end of the year. And that's when we'll start transitioning into a DAO. Uh, so yeah, that's really it. I uh, appreciate your time. Um, I know that's a lot. Happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks, Carlos. We'll move into the Q&A now. Uh, th thanks, Carlos. Um, I must say your uh, your pitch deck is uh, worth spending the whole evening with a bottle of whiskey, I guess, to to understand all the complexity, all the stuff. And uh, I, uh, that being said, uh, you mentioned one uh, one case, for example, Uniswap. If they somehow decide to um, liquidate three percent of their treasury, um, let's say they need it quick right uh so something happens and they need uh cash and so they if they do it current uh, the current situation uh they will lose as you said like 80 percent of their uh, uh market cap currently so if they're if they are your clients for example let's say uniswap is five clients what exactly in layman terms what exactly will happen from the business perspective that will prevent Uniswap from losing market cap, but still getting that cash that they desperately need in case they decide to liquidate 3% of their um, treasury. Yeah. So I'll caveat it. Obviously we'll have to grow into that type of allocation, uh, which is one of the beautiful things about this exchange fund model in that the more it scales, the more you can diversify where you risk and the more you can kind of take on these large allocations. Um, so assuming we're at the scale where we have room for 3% of their treasury, what would happen is that they would deposit that directly into our protocol and then mint back the equivalent value in our treasury token. So it doesn't actually hit the open market sale. You can almost think of it as being locked in a vault, right? So now that Uniswap has this treasury token, 
if they then do want to like exchange it, obviously you can send it to a peer, but let's say they just want to actually move it into cash at that point or sustainable coins or off ramp it or something like that. So we have a redemption mechanism as well. So similar to how USDC works, similar to how ETFs work, right? So they would sell it on the open market. And then there's a few different mechanisms from there that we, we implement to kind of spread out the sell pressure, right? At the very minimum, we're working with market makers so that they can uh, facilitate this redemption process. Um, the market maker can then go in and they can essentially deposit the treasury token back into our protocol. And what they would receive back is a handful of tokens. So they would receive back a combination of the tokens that are most overweight in our protocol, uh, but then also like a basket that represents the underlying liquidity. So similar mechanisms to how an ETF works. So in this way, we can, instead of selling one token on the market, we essentially sell bits and pieces of a lot of different tokens, right? So even if we get back 10 tokens, all of a sudden that sell pressure is 10X less, right? Uh, the other thing we're doing is this protocol owned liquidity mechanism. So one of the reasons why there's so much slippage that occurs is because of the concept of impermanent loss, right? So you have this two-sided bonding curve, just say ETH and Uniswap, uh, but then as the prices converge when there's very volatile environment, what these market ma uh, autonomous market makers do is they'll unwind their position. So they don't have to suffer from an impermanent loss. But what that, ha what that does is it causes, it makes it so there's less liquidity in the system when it's needed the most, when the market is most volatile and people want to get liquidity. So it causes a lot more slippage uh, and increasingly so, right? So the, the bands of the trading volume become much narrower. Uh, but for us, we are, instead of allowing those groups to unwind their positions, we want to buy those LP, LP tokens from them uh, in exchange from the, we're get, essentially giving them the FI treasury token at a slight discount to the market. And the FI treasury token is fully backed by the revenue that the protocol is generating. So they can then sell us the LP token. They can take the FI sell on the market if they need to. But then the protocol owns these LP token pairs. And we're not interested in unwinding those or timing the market. We want this to be a permanent base of liquidity. So over time, as we reinvest into these LP tokens, we'll start having more and more pairs. It'll be Treasury at USDC, Treasury ETH, you know, Treasury Tether, for example. And over time, then we can even expand into other different token pairs to really expand the optionality of the liquidity that we can kind of help flow into the system to really aggregate and disintermediate the sell pressure. Because the really fundamental issue is that Uniswap has two token pairs, and we want to make that optionality amongst as many different tokens as possible all at one time. Uh, th thanks, but is, is, am I right to understand that uh, actually you will be only able to manage uh, such treasuries like Uniswap, for example, if you already have uh, much higher liquidity in your system? So, I mean, like, this is the hand and egg problem here for me. I mean, like, to to attract a lot of liquidity from, from players like Uniswap or any other huge treasuries, uh, you need to show them that you already have much more liquidity in your system. So how do you plan yeah. to to join the market with, with the huge liquidity already in your pocket? Yeah, so the, the large centralized, decentralized DAOs, that'll definitely be a client base that we have to pursue a little bit later. Just going after governance proposals it's like running for politics we have to show track record so initially on day one uh, we are getting clients that are kind of outside of that so some of them are just service providers that get paid in uni that might still have a million or two in assets uh, or just kind of um, some family offices that just want to have an index but what we can do within the pool let's say we someone just deposits uscc because they want this index exposure then we can sell that USDC and accumulate the rest of the assets that we need in order to create this diversified pool, right? So the goal is to start at about 20 million, which is what we're gonna do now. That'll amount to a certain amount of liquidity thresholds and we really wanna test that out. And then as we start getting more and more deposits and there's also an incentive mechanism within the protocol to uh, essentially help, help grow the assets in a sustainable way, right? Uh, there'll be penalties when we have too much of one asset, for example. So no one can just dump uh, one particular token and cause this uh, systemic risk. 
So as the value of the TVO grows, then we'll be able to kind of get more and more bigger clients to come and deposit in. But for example, one of our one of the clients that we're speaking to a lot are some of the largest Bitcoin miners in the world. And they could deposit wrap Bitcoin, which is highly liquid, which we could sell at scale and diversify across the board. And for these Bitcoin miners, they have the same issue where their revenue and their expenses don't really match, right? They need to break that correlation. And they realize that the best way to do that is to diversify. And by then also be able to generate, generate yield, it's like an additional bonus for them where they can actually create a more sustainable company. Thank you. Right, Carlos, thanks for sharing. Um, there's actually a question for our audience. Um, it's from Harry. By spreading the sell pressure, doesn't this mean you are devaluing the other tokens? And how does a protocol manage their risk exposure to collapse of other tokens? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the last one. So by having this dynamic weight system, we're also building momentum indicators. So we've developed uh, things like several different nodes, for example, to monitor as the on-chain transactions come in, as well as kind of different pricing feeds. So the goal is that we would monitor different indicators on like a, a tick level basis, buck level, you know, five seconds, 10 seconds. And then if these indicators start breaching downward too quickly on like a, let's say two standard deviation level, then we can quarantine those assets, which is a unique aspect to what we're doing. So when they're quarantined, we'll stop rebalancing into those assets so that then at least we kind of segregate them. And if they keep breaching these levels, we will eject them from the pool either uh, through incentivizing swaps, but also through just kind of open market sales across different DEXs and sexes uh, to really kind of hopefully mitigate this pressure, right? And that's kind of always a risk, right? Even USCC, which previously was thought to be the safest thing, de at one point, right? And that became an existential risk for a lot of these projects. In terms of devaluing the value of the token, um, the studies that we've seen when ETFs were first introduced in traditional finance, the liquidity and the, the kind of upward volatility, so upper price movement for the tokens in those X indexes actually improve. And you see that when a new project gets introduced like the SP 500, for example. So we expect something similar. The big question is on the liquidity, like how much can we sell at one point, right? Because liquidity is nonlinear. You can sell up to a certain amount, but then once you hit this inflection point, you really start having to take on less and less value for a sale. And that's where our portfolio management mechanisms come in at. We really wanna, uh, we're really building the algorithms to really price that in and to really help, that'll kind of go directly into how much tokens we'll take in and then our incentive mechanism, right? So we start getting close to the point where if we do start having to sell, we breach into this concentration limit and we cause an imbalance in like the order book or the liquidity pool, we'll start lowering that uh, token allocation slowly but surely and really doing things in, in over time and not all at once, which is where really you get this downward pricing pressure. All right, Loving. that's great. Uh, that's been a really long Q&A session. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, Carlos. So now we'll move on to the third and final startup for today. So we will have uh, Toby from BitPower on. Hi. Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me today. Um, yeah, my name is Toby, um, Toby Uchiki. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of BitPower. Um, can you guys see my screen? Uh, let me see. Yeah. Um, awesome, so basically BitPower is building um, blockchain infrastructure for financial institutions and businesses to be able to build uh, financial products for the end users, right? So. Um, today, there is, um, we can see um, high adoption of, um, of, of blockchain technology across um, financial services from TITA processing more transaction volume than MasterCard last year, uh, MasterCard and Visa, so 88% of crypto transactions are basically cross-border transactions, so then over 60% of uh, asset managers have purchased like, oh, like uh, stable coins in the past 12 months. This shows a lot of a lot of interest on love using in terms of uh, businesses um, providing financial service for users. You can see from Stripe as well now investing um, in crypto by offering crypto uh, off ramp and also I, I believe on ramp, right? So Visa now investing and Massacre as well investing in uh, investing millions in 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 the blockchain for them to be able to you know provide 
financial services and expand their financial aspirations um, on the blockchain, right? So basically the um, blockchain adoption has corrected across financial services. Um, however, existing solutions are not designed for fintechs from fire blocks to bitcoins to survival, right? These solutions are not designed um, for fintechs. Um, they are very, um, today, building blockchain power solutions to embed financial services or to provide, or to provide financial services to the end user uh, basically um, takes months for you to, for you to get started with. Um, time consuming, a very, very expensive as a traditional business or a business that's trying to expand their financial operation on the blockchain. Um, it costs you a lot from the hiring cost of, uh, from the cost of hiring engineers to the cost of uh, building tech and every other thing, right? This will cost you more for you to be able to provide financial services for end users um, using the blockchain, right? And as well, uh, building on the blockchain or providing financial services on the blockchain is complex because you have to think of um, the blockchain you want to use and also trying to, you know, uh, go through all the whole capacity. As a business, who just are looking to expand their financial operation or embed financial services using the blockchain technology, uh, this is basically more complex for them to get started with. And that's basically why we are building BitPower. So BitPower is basically uh, a modern um, financial infrastructure for uh, businesses or institutions to build uh, financial products um, using the blockchain technology from compliance to custody to ledger infrastructure, to wallets, to tokenization, to settlement. BitPower is basically providing um, the uh, a single platform uh, for anyone to be able to uh, access such um, features. And in the last um, seven, 11 months that we've gone live with our first customer, we've onboarded over 40 um, customers uh, across um, Africa, Europe, and Asia. We've processed over $50 million transaction volume in just in better. And currently, we grew around 30% month on month, right? This is really awesome. And the fact that we are seeing better and we've already uh, processed this uh, volume in just 11 months. So today, we work with uh, businesses in Africa, Asia, and Europe, right? And the uh, majority of customers we work with are, are new banks and fintechs that basically embed the power um, solutions to be able to uh, provide financial services for their end users, so our product. So basically, BitPower provide an entity platform and easy to integrate services from the wallet um, infrastructure that basically helps you to create and manage thousands of wallets and generate uh, crypto uh, addresses across multiple um, blockchains to the custody infrastructure, which is uh, an institutional programmable MPC based custody solution to help you secure and manage the data asset, asset operations. So this can be embedded into any wallet product or any product alongside our wallet uh, to be able to provide um, to be able to provide uh, a, a secure wallet system for end users. So if you're a, if you're a team or you are a business to look, looking to an exchange or a fintech looking to uh, manage the data sets for your customers, basically uh, we provide this, um, a, a, a custody solution that can be integrated via the API or through an SDK that can be embedded into your product. Right. The third thing as well is our ledger infrastructure, which is basically a database, um, a, a, a database for money movement. So basically, you want to have a single set of truths for your transactions and balances across on-chain and off-chain transactions. And the power basically solve that by providing you um, a ledger infrastructure that can basically help you to record your off-chain and on-chain transactions and also to be able to manage um, your customers' balances to avoid fraud, uh, to be able to buy these, those transactions across the different chain and also ability for you to be able to build um, to, be able to, to be able to build a, an efficient digital wallet that can support multiple currencies, both virtual currencies as well as um, uh, on-chain assets like EOS 20 and so on. Um, then the last thing we offer our customers is a compliance infrastructure that basically provides you a, uh, a single platform for you to integrate into leading compliance services from transaction monitoring from um, transaction monitoring to to identity platform to case management. So let's say you are so basically you can connect your analysis, sieved, um, elliptic, or microscience uh, API key to our compliance infrastructure, and automatically all your transactions you have processed basically will be going to be run through the services and can give you a, a, a profile of the kind of transactions uh, your customers are processing without actually writing a but we're actually writing any code. So basically, it's a no code to, to integrate into compliance services. You can connect to identity platform like some sort 
and also some in Africa, like um, um, Identity Pass as well, where you can easily connect, create a profile of your customers and kind of transactions uh, they, are, they are processing without writing any code, right? So our platform basically, our service, our product basically provides a single platform for you to be able to issue, uh, to be able to create and manage wallets across multiple blockchains, deploy MBC based custody solution across different environment, then as well as um, record um, your off-chain and on-chain transactions, uh, um, and as well as get a uh, get compliant from day one, right? So how we make money? So we make money um, in two ways. We make money from the subscription fee. So using our platform, you get to pay from hundred dollar to two thousand dollars based on the pricing plan you are on, right? And um, you pay from hundred dollar to two thousand dollars, right? Based on the plan you are on. Then from transaction fee, we charge a fractional to that transaction right from 0.25% to 0.01% based on the volume, um, based on the, on the volume um, you process, right? So, and of course, we charge stable coins to not uh, stable coins to avoid the FX market um, across different countries. So, uh, Bitpower basically is built natively for businesses or institutions that are looking to embed financial services into their product um, using the blockchain technology. So we are simple to use. We are built this um, efficiently for um, for any business who is looking to uh, manage data assets for their customers, uh, basically um, build a closed loop payment system or build a cash back payment, uh, a, 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 a cash back program on in-app earnings for their end users uh, using the blockchain technology, right? So um, our growth strategy. So basically, we started out with um, startups and of course as well um, crypto exchanges for us to be able to um, validate um, our products. Then now we are trying to go after uh, financial institutions, banks, new banks, financial businesses, for us to be able to know uh, help them embed our financial services into our products. And we um, today we get our customers from inbound, um, from search results, from communities, and as well as. Prefer, right? And the major way we um, get our customers right now uh, as well is direct sales, basically sales led where we go after this kind of customers and like uh, the show makers and try to like demo uh, with them. Um, using the inbound like search engine right now, if you go on Google right now and you search for wallet infrastructure, Bitpower basically comes as the first um, as, as, as the first option as a result or when you start for wallet infrastructure across different um, when you search for wallet infrastructure, and the way we think of our climate, our, our, our growth strategy is by also um, going through the uh, Web3 developer community, um, deal driven, where we get to uh, provide more a, a, a APIs for developers to build uh, financial services um, as well, right? So um, today, so we started out, to, we launched our product in January 2022, and we went live with our first customer in April 2022. Um, by December last year, we were already, already onboarded 40 customers and already processing around $2 million per month. Um, today, we are already processing $50 million. We've, today, we've uh, processed $50 million so far, and we are currently around $5 million in total, in total deposit and $10 million in total transaction volume processed per month. And uh, we currently support 15 blockchains. By December, we are looking to onboard over 150 clients and um, process December um, 2023, by the end of this year, we're looking to onboard close to 50, 150 clients uh, and process like and the points, we're still processing like around $50 million in total, in basically deposit volume. Then at that point as well, we are looking to have launched our crypto accounting, also start our settlement infrastructure and as well as uh, expand our product to enable more integrations across uh, different services that we are providing. Um, um, myself, uh, I have background in computer science and as well as in cryptography. Over, I have over eight years of experience in software engineering uh, across building, building a different products from uh, majorly, uh, majorly I have experience in building data enterprise products and I've, I've been able to work with different companies, majorly in the US as a remote um, directly from Africa, then as well as working with companies in Mauritius and of course in Nigeria, right? And um, my team, um, my co-founder, Marach Amich as well, who is as well as background in accounting and finance, and as well she worked for a blockchain company in Dubai, and as well as managing um, print uh, blockchain um, product. Uh, basically, then so our our engineering lead, who are, who's also a very experienced technology leader, that's but that, that's basically helped a lot of companies, majorly in the US as well as in Africa, to build um, scalable to put their system in finance and the blockchain industry. So our education background 
basically is our computer science and as well as um, accounting. And uh, our team all together basically have had uh, over, the, over the years experience all together uh, in building uh, in building successful um, blockchain and fintech products. Um, in our in in one of the products we built uh, that, that I led in our previous workplace, I we built a product, um, basically a blockchain off arm product, and that has been that has been used over like close to over five hundred thousand users um, down Hi, in Toby. Africa. Hi. Thanks so much for this. I'll just give you a couple more seconds to wrap up. Oh no problem. I'm I'm actually wrapping up already. Okay. Yeah, so basically our team have, have a lot enough experience to be to be able to build what we're trying to build right now. Um, yeah, so at the moment, uh, so basically today we are backed by leading investors and founders from 500 Global to First Impact to Velocity Town and Pillar Uh In summary, basically we are powering the future of finance. Uh, we, are, we are powering the future of finance on the blockchain. Uh, we've onboarded 40 customers. We've processed over 40 million dollar, uh, over 50 million dollar international volume, and we are basically um, building the next. Um, um, the next uh, modern financial infrastructure using the blockchain. Thank you. Yeah, so if you have any questions, I'll, I'll like to take your questions now. Yeah, th um, thanks, Oitoki. Uh, actually, on the last slide, you had. Um, the links to see the use cases uh i like kind of a feedback uh i, I really wish there was kind of a use, use case explained uh in in the pitch deck and you know like some very simple case because if uh, if i understand everything correctly you're providing kind of an infrastructure for uh traditional businesses and uh, some financial management companies to process crypto and uh, doing that very simple without having any problems with authorities, with compliance, with banks and, and things like that. So uh, yeah. it, it, is it right that they are possible to to receive crypto for their services or goods or whatever, and then they have cash on their bank account and, and they can pay taxes and all things? Is, is it what you're doing for them? No. So basically, we so basically we are an infrastructure. So they basically embed our products, our API into their products. So Let's say you have been an, an, an a crypto exchange, for example, and you okay. want to use our wallet infrastructure to be able to create wallet addresses for your customers into their product. So they use Bitbar to be able to do that. That's the first part. If okay. you want to be able to use a custody solution like MPC back, uh, MPC based custody solution to embed into your product as well, you can use Bitbar custody to do that, right? Then Ledger to be able to record financial services. So basically, we are in we are an infrastructure that will basically provide the services via an API. For them to be able to build um, financial products, so uh, we basically provide them the infrastructure. So yeah. So you 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 don't serve as any kind of a provider um, or, or kind of a bridge between cash and crypto. Um, so you, you're only giving you're giving the tech infrastructure, exactly. or or some financial and custodial infrastructure as well. Yeah, exactly. So right. So uh, I mean, in, in the future, we plan to uh, enable our settlement infrastructure. That can actually provide such services for them. But for now, we provide them the infrastructure where um, they can easily build and like basically uh, undo everything. So we have like the backend infrastructure for them to embed financial services into their. Okay, so it, can, can I call you correctly? Some kind of SaaS for for yeah, for basically the, yeah, crypto yeah, SaaS exactly. for fintech. Exactly. So I B two B model SaaS basically. Like, okay. Okay. Uh, so and uh, actually, you you charge either through a subscription model or uh, through a per transaction model? Is it a client who chooses the model or is it you depending on the volumes? So like we charge them like bits. So we charge them both subscription fee and transaction fee. So uh, yeah, so basically they choose a plan they want to be on. So they can say they want to be on startup plan to business plan to enterprise plan. And that would determine the, uh, the, the, um, the subscription fee they pay and transaction fee they pay, right? So the more, uh, I, the higher the plan you are on, the lesser the um, transaction fee, but of course the higher the um, subscription fee. So it can be from hundred dollar to two thousand dollars based on the subscription fee, then zero point two five percent to zero point one percent based on the transaction volume that you process, like outgoing transaction volume that you process. Um, my, my last question, or short one: How do you how do you feel uh, and see what are your unique selling points compared to to many other? tech infrastructure providers, uh, maybe it's kind of market-wise or tech-wise. 
how, what what is what is the unique stuff that makes you uh, outstanding on this market? Okay, cool. So I think the first thing is um, is is a market that we uh, that we are that that we are focusing. So we are focusing in the, in, in the emerging market like Africa, Asia, right? And what we basically for do for them is by uh, simplifying um, how they tend to build um, how they tend how they tend to build uh, financial services or using the blockchain technology, right? So I mean, majority of our other customers basically provide complex system for them to be able to build. So they need to go hire engineering, um, blockchain engineering team, spend a lot of time. So what we are basically doing for them is to reduce the cost and as well as reduce the time they spend, right? And also provide them simple services for them to be able to, uh, for them to be able to uh, do a couple of things like ability to create wallets uh, for their end users, ability to also uh, record all their financial, all their financial operations using our ledger, right? Is an ledger technology, meaning they can now build an efficient digital wallet that basically avoids any fraudulent activities or basically any any or basically any engineering mistake that could have that could have gone into building a an, an internal ledger system. So basically reducing that engineering time they spend on doing all those things and just providing them the infrastructure. All right, Albert, do you have any questions to add? Yeah, um, maybe quickly. Thanks again, Toby, for the presentation. Um, I'm I'm just impressed with the fifty million numbers that you presented. I mean, all of like this thirty plus customers that you have. What's the biggest chance of the service that they actually use? And second, maybe regarding compliance, because I understood that in Africa you have like these different communities. How are you legally compliant with these different communities, let alone like the different currency system there? Okay. So in terms of um, the kind of customers that we grow, that we, like I said earlier, um, so majority of our customers are like new banks and fintechs that are basically using stablecoin to expand their financial operation. So um, for example, now Africa basically, um, payment is, is very big in Africa and as well, and due to dollar scarcity, right? Um, the cost of payment is actually a very big market, right? There's a remittance and everything, right? So a lot of, a, a lot of fintech now, are now going through the blockchain um, to be able to provide such services for their customers to be able to send money from Africa down to um, down to like you know um, US, China, and other countries, right? And they are all using stablecoin to be able to do that, right? So now for them to be able to do that, they have the they, they don't have the experience, they don't have the technology, they don't have the engineering team to be able to do that. And the way we help them do that is by providing that infrastructure. For them to be able to start integrating blockchain into their financial operation, right? And what we have done basically is to provide that for them. So a lot of these companies are basically fintechs, uh, new banks that basically help their customers to be able to send and receive money globally, right? Using stablecoin and other digital assets across different chain like Stellar, um, Ethereum, using second assets, right? Then second, um, then second kind of customers is the payment gateways as well, um, that basically um, uses uh, that basically um, uses uh, crypto payments at method of uh, customers to be able to receive and get paid globally right then the other customers are just traditional businesses that provide this kind of uh traditional businesses that provide this kind of uh, internal wallet for their customers to be able to like old balances and every other thing right so what we have done for them is by providing them that infrastructure for them to be able to build a closed loop payment system right for them to be able to retain their customer by having a wallet into their product and the wallets can basically uh power both via uh, both uh, both can basically help them to record both on chain and uh, and fiat uh, currencies, right? And basically simplify that, right? Because a lot of these guys uh, trying to manage them together can can basically cause a lot of issues and can also result to fraud. And what we have done basically is to provide them that infrastructure for them to be able to um, to be able to to embed such services in, into that product. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, and 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 basically, um, the goal basically is to build a, a a blockchain, a financial rail on the blockchain where everyone uh, can basically interact with blockchain without them knowing they're interacting with blockchain. Today, right now, a lot of businesses in Africa are using blockchain, right? Without the end users knowing that they're using blockchain, right? And that's mm -hmm. like the that, that's like the biggest um, use case of uh, of the blockchain technology, where you can easily send money from one place to another, from uh, Nigeria to China. From Nigeria to or US, and also receive money using stablecoin and other digital assets. So that's basically all right. Trying to power. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Toby. All right. Um, we'll just go ahead to wrap up and uh, conclude the event. 
So I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Great. All right. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, great. Thank you, everyone, for the pitch today. Um, really exciting ideas and very interesting. I'm very intrigued with each of the business ideas. Um, quickly about what we are presenting here. So as we mentioned earlier in the beginning, we have our own incubator program. It's called BFG Superstars. And then at the end of each program, we will have a demo day. And this is the first ever public preview of each of these projects. So please make sure to stay tuned and join us next month. And then this will be the first time they will present in public what their business ideas and your opinions also matters for us because after that, we will also make our decision in which teams that we will invest in. So stay tuned and make sure you register for the upcoming event. Um, with that said, I would like to give over to Melissa to announce our top two teams for today. So the judges scores are in. Thanks so much, Yaroslav, and thanks, Albert, for stepping in as well. So we now have our top two teams, and I'm happy to share that they are Fight and BitPower. So all three teams actually came really close, uh, but these two teams just came out a couple of points ahead of, of the other. So congratulations to the both of these teams. Your pitches were really smooth, and you impressed us the most today. And with all of that, we would like to thank our judges, our startups, and our viewers for spending the past hour with us and for making this event so successful. So the event will be available on YouTube and the link will be sent to all participants after this. If you would like to get in touch with any of the pitching events, uh, startups, feel free to reach out to any of us on the team. If you would like to attend future editions of this pitch event as well, you can join us in June at our, our demo day for the season three startups. So follow us on our social media platforms, LinkedIn, Twitter, and you can even join our Slack channel. Subscribe to our newsletter to get the latest marketing emails and notifications for the event. So we do have a post-event survey that you can scan here and complete to leave some feedback or things that you would like to see more of in future editions. And with not much else left, I'll be closing the event. And I would like to thank everybody for attending it today with us on Zoom, on YouTube, and just spending your time with us. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.